Hello, everybody, and welcome to another week of the Rec Poker Podcast Forums Edition. I'm your host, Jim Reed, Bluff Storini in the home games, and at Hold'em underscore Steelers on Twitter. Uh, I'd like to thank Learn Pro Poker, Website Amp, and Running Aces Hotel Racetrack and Casino for making this web uh, this podcast possible. And I'd like to thank my illustrious panel here for joining me and talking uh, poker tonight. Chris uh, Jones, why don't you lead us off? Yeah, I'm Chris Jones. Uh, glad to be here. Five by five on Poker Stars and Twitter. And I am John Somsky, Poker Geek MN everywhere. And I'm Rob Washam. I'm Radman50 everywhere. And last but certainly not least, Taylor Moss. <laughs> uh, you can find me on Twitter at Taylor underscore Moss or in the Rec Poker home game as Gopher Boy TJM. No one would ever put you at the bottom of the list, Taylor, don't you worry. Only alphabetically, I assure you. Mm -hmm. uh, so just like every week, we are playing in the Rec Poker nightly home game, trying to take each other's chips and earn that elusive bronze pin. And just like every week, we will take a post from the Rec.Poker forums and talk about it here on the air with the Wizards of the Rec Poker panel. So this is a post called When to Take a Flip by one of our favorite posters in the forums. This is by Monkey System. And he has a spot where he's faced with a chance to take a flip and wants to talk about what are the factors to consider when you're in a position like this and when should you pull the trigger and when should you just wait for a better spot or a better time in the tournament. So I'll just take us through the uh, pre-flop action here quickly and then we can talk about some of the uh, factors that one might consider. So our hero, our hero correspondent is in the big blind with 19 and a half big blinds. It, there's eight players in the hand. Under the gun limps. It folds around to the button who raises to four. And hero, it folds around to hero who's holding king, queen offsuit. And I'm sure about it this time. And, uh, is faced with a decision and elects to shove all in here over the uh, raise over limper. So the, as, as it happens, the under the gun player folds and the button calls the uh, remaining 15 and a quarter big blinds. So it doesn't really matter what the button has to have a conversation about this. We'll get to that a little later. But um, the question that uh, monkey system has here is, is this a good spot to take a flip in a vacuum? And we're not in a vacuum. So what are some of the factors that we might consider when also uh, thinking about making this flip? And so he, he leads into the conversation with talking about the stack size, which is a little less than 20 big blinds and well below average on the table and within the tournament, which has uh, certainly the table value. I think there's some relevance to that. And knowing where you are in the tournament, I think is, valuable from time to time. Um, so that's a good thing to be paying attention to. And uh, says that if we win this flip, we're now the chip leader at the table. So it must be an interesting chip dynamic there if they're the low stack, but if they double up, they'll be the chip leader. So that tells you something about the stack sizes there. And he also says that our sample size on the villain does not yield statistically significant results. So uh, all we can say is that we don't know a lot, <laughs> which makes it a good time to have one of these general conversations. So um, here, why don't you guys take a, take a stab at what, what, what are you thinking about at that point when you are considering taking a flip? Like I'd love to know where in the, how close to the money we, are, we were here, for instance, that has something to do with it for me. Yeah. It, generally speaking, like it's a little bit different for like our nightly series uh, with ICM. Like really the only ICM is winning because that's what everyone's playing for. So the, the in terms of ICM, it's almost negligible. But if you are in like a real tournament for money, you know, uh, other things potentially on the line, like uh, don't take flips near money bubbles or in spots that have heavy ICM implications. Uh, then, you know, the value of your chips are a little bit more uh, in terms of the monetary value than the EV value. So try to not take flips in those spots. Doesn't mean avoid them. Uh, try to just get into flip spots. Uh, the other thing that I think is really interesting 
probably something that we aren't really intentionally calling out, but catches my intention is we, the post is titled when to take a flip, uh, which to me implies calling in a spot where we think we're flipping. Uh, but then this is about shoving all in. Um, so the huge difference in my opinion there is when we shove all in, we have fold equity. We can get our opponents to fold and then we win 100% of the time if we get that to occur. Uh, if someone shoves into us and we're deciding, should we take this flip? Uh, now that it's different because now we're just making the pure uh, EV calculation decision of saying like, how often do I think I'm winning against my opponent's range? And do these two cards that I have have enough equity versus what I suspect their range is? So although unintentional, I think that's a huge component of like this type of discussion. I'm not sure if anyone else kind of feels similar about that. No, I, I, I thought of that as soon as I saw the action after looking at the title. I said, you're not really taking a flip there. Um, what you're doing is putting a lot of pressure on a wide, big blind range. And to Taylor's point, you have, you have a lot of fold equity right there. You're coming in with 19 big blinds. That's going to be a big hit to that stack. Big blind could be doing that very wide. So at this point in time, you're taking an aggressive action to take down the pot right now, not necessarily taking a flip. So you don't know that anybody's going to call you. Yeah. And to clarify, you mean a, a wide button range. That's what, yeah, 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 that's what I meant. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're in the big blind versus the, right, right. what we presume is probably a little bit wider of a button range. Correct. What what is uh what what is the under the gun limp do for you here? Does it does it change any of your thinking? I think if the under the gun had fewer chips, it might be one of those hands where you know you limp with aces and hope somebody gets frisky behind you. But he has enough chips that he's kind of on par with everybody else at the table, other than uh, our hero. So I think, I don't believe that that's what that move is. I think it's just limping in with, you know, a small pocket pair hoping to see a cheap block. What it does impact for me though, is the buttons range. Um, if we remove the limp and have the button just open up, I love this, you know, rejam spot. Like this is like textbook apply pressure to what should be a wide range and get them to fold a lot. Uh, the under the gun limp though, impacts my button range or the range that I put on the button, which actually makes this kind of like a tough decision. Uh, Cause now when they limp and then they go four big blinds, uh, it reduces our fold equity. Cause now our jam is less sizable of how many chips we have and what is the size of that and how much do they have to call uh, to uh, call our jam. Uh, so it actually impacts ranging and our decisions a lot just because of that under the gun person even if we say hey 100 percent of the time the under the gun person is going to fold here uh still impacts uh what we have to think about the button yeah i mean and in fact that's that's if in game i would fold this because of that limp um that it, whereas if the button had just opened like you said just sort of straight up off of a, off a it folded the button they opened then I'm probably jamming this every time. Um, but it really, I, I don't like that dynamic that it sets up. And I feel like, you you know, we don't know that the end of the gun is going to fold every time. But even if we did know that, it, it just, it creates a tougher spot for us. Um, and king queen offsuit is really, it's it's right on that borderline of what I'm going to do this with. And that's it, that puts my border just a little bit higher. Yep, I like that. So we got yeah. some good, yeah, go ahead, Taylor. Uh, I was just gonna comment a little bit more on like the exact hand, like king, queen offsuit is the like type of hands that we probably want to like be shoving here. If we had king, queen suited, I think there's, you know, inclination to, you know, calling, it's, you know, just another three big blinds to us. There's a decent chance under the gun also calls just that little bit more of extra playability uh, can constitute a call. Uh, whereas shoving some offsuit combos that have a little bit less playability um, can be a right decision there. But yeah, I, 
in this exact spot, I'm leaning towards fold. And to get back to like the topic of it, and I know some of the comments said like he knew he was in a flip situation, which I'd argue you do not know <laughs> that. Uh, with king queen offsuit, you're in a, a spot where you're you're hoping they have an yeah. under pair to you. Yep. Because uh, everything else that calls off for you either has you pipped or in extremely bad shape. So uh, that's the part of it that makes us really tough is when they call us, they probably just have us in a 65-35 uh, spot if we think about what is their range versus our exact holding. Yeah, and that's one of the, that's one of the problems with king-queen offsuit period is that it, it, it stacks up very poorly with continuing ranges to aggressive action like that because all the best hands just have it crushed. You know, um, you're, you're actually better off having a hand like seven, eight suited because you have more, you're, you're alive in more ways um, against the range of queens plus and ace queen plus when you have king queen, you're just, you're just never ahead there. Um, and if you're saying, you know, best case scenario, they're going to get in there with jacks or tens or nines. And so I've got this flip. You know, that's not really what a flip is <laughs> when you're factoring in the whole range, you know. And um, Doug also makes a point here in the forums. And again, guys, go to the forums and you can read all this great broken down stuff by all these folks. We just kind of gloss over it here and we get some of the highlights to talk about on the, on the episode. But um, Doug makes a similar point here about, you know, maybe you could actually, given the stack sizes, maybe you could call here and kind of try and exercise a skill edge post-flop. I think uh, if it's suited, that's, that's a much, that's a much more, you know, there, there's a lot to that. And, uh, you know, we, we talked last week about how different actions can kind of contort your opponent's range. And this is another one of those circumstances where when you are shoving here, you benefit from the time that they have a lot of bluffs that they're going to fold. And so even when they do continue with better hands, you're still ahead in the long run. Um, if you could call here, you're allowing them to continue in the hand with a lot of those hands that are way behind you or that you have, you know, better equity against at least. Now, the downside is you have to play out of position multi-way. You know, that's not fun either in a pretty low SPR situation. I wonder, do you guys think if they were much deeper or much shallower, would that change the way you think about this spot here from a sizing point of view or from a getting it in point of view? Doesn't sound like it, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yes, yeah, definitely. Uh, to me, again, if if we don't have this limp in there, mm. um, I this is a kind of stack depth where I, I do sometimes, I, I open up my sort of like flatting range um, where um, I'm going to flat, maybe, you know, Taylor, you mentioned king queen offsuit is one you probably jam with king queen suited is one you'd probably flat. I, I would probably be flatting both of them if there's no li intervening limper um, and finding some other ones that I'm jamming um, because I feel like they're, they're hands that I can see a flop cheaply, but also put a lot of pressure on. They're also hands that I'm willing to donk with a lot in this spot, in this exact spot with a late position. Let's just say we don't have our limper. We've got a late position opener. I'm in the big blind. I have 20 big blinds. That's the spot I'm really looking for that kind of like call and then donk. Um, it, it's a very effective thing. And, and this is the kind of hand I'm, I'm trying to do it with sometimes. So um, but yeah, if I'm much deeper, then yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm probably, I mean, and if I'm up, if I'm much shallower, I'm shoving. And if I'm much deeper, uh, how much deeper? <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, everything's I, on the table, right? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think this is kind of one of those hands that are, that might be in my big blind defend range. But to Chris's point, the one factor that might change that is that under the gun limp. Mm -hmm. um, now, if, you, if you're going to assume that he's just going to call along, this might would be just a, a big blind, um, you know, defend range with a deeper stack. Yep. 
so Doug, Doug makes the point about uh, calling and how that has some pros and cons. Uh, Binkley makes another great breakdown in here, uh, calculating the EV of several different plays according to the different ranges of the opponents and the amount of dead money in the pot and that kind of stuff. Um, and my hat's off to Monkey System. He makes a great point here, um, talking about the difference between cash games and tournaments. And uh, I like this, this line here. He's got so many, this wonderfully detailed post here. Says, As stacks shorten, the tools in our poker toolbox get taken away incrementally. And I think that's true. Um, and one, the, the other side of that is that it makes it, you, you have fewer tools, but you can commit to those remaining tools more readily. So I think one of the things that Chris is getting at is that in this stack size, if you do call, you're gonna get an SPR where you can pretty comfortably get it in with one pair here. Um, and you don't have to worry about having a big stack behind putting your tournament life in. Uh, and it's, I think it's actually kind of like a higher variance play because you, you aren't going to, uh, we talk sometimes about how calling can be higher variance than uh, shoving. Um, but it feels like this is a, yeah, I think you're on something there, Chris, when it comes to having that ability to, and this is what Doug says as well, about making like a better decision on the flop about your opponent's range relative to your hand, then you'll be able to um, pre-flop when they, when they continue so strongly. Uh, Monkey System also says there are some other things about um, some examples about chip EV and where in the tournament you might do it. Talks about more likely to take flips, uh, playing more speculative hands with different stack depths, limping behind multi-way pots with big pairs. And our friend uh, Jamin96 and uh, Binkley get in here again, making some other, uh, other excellent points about where in a tournament you might want to tighten up, where you might want to get more uh, volatile in, in where you, uh, you want to take those chances. So short answer, monkey system, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. depends it yeah depends. it depends the, the best poker answer ever yeah that's right but uh, I hope and just to touch on one more thing quick um i i ran some numbers quick in terms of like what do i think the button would ultimately call with and we are really close to like a 65 35 spot so like thinking that we're in a flip is probably incorrect but that doesn't mean if we're in a situation that if we get called by an all in, we're gonna have 35% equity is the wrong decision. Cause there is potential that we could make up that 50% or 15% that we need to get to 50 through fold equity. Um, and I think the big thing that changes in this one is there's probably less fold equity cause their opening range, if it just gets to the button is huge. Let's say it's 50% of opening hands. And if we can jam and to get them to fold, you know, 40 out of that 50 so they're only calling 20 percent of the time and we're getting a fold 80 percent of the time that's going to make up for it and we can make that jam a little bit looser than we think because a lot of people kind of approach these situations be like when i jam i need to be you know at a 50 50 ev type of spot but they forget that when they jam there's a lot of fold equity that's in that pot when they can make this play this exact hand I think button has a smaller than their normal opening range. So if it was 50%, maybe now it's down to like 25%. And if they call with that same 10%, uh, just using rough numbers before 80% of the time, we just won. Now that's down to, was it 60% of the time? Mm -hmm. uh, so like that just shrunk that part of the equation just shrunk substantially. And the other part where, we're getting in as a 35% favorite is much bigger. And that that's what really is the crushing effect of this exact hand. That's a great point. And, and it's the effect that Chris pointed out earlier of having that limper in the hand that has changed the range of the button from instead of just opening with half the hands in the deck. Now they're, they're, they're already being more selective about the hands that they're choosing to forex over that limper. So, there's just fewer of those losing hands that they were going to fold to your raise to begin with. So this is a great example of how, and I know monkey system already knows this. So I'm just talking to everybody out there in the audience. This is one of those moments where, you know, your hand is important, 
but the range that you can put on your opponents is so important and it can change not not even just on these cusp hands but it can change the the mathematics of whether it's a solid play with some of the hands that you might be surprised um, as well so really th really think about how does the action affect people's ranges what assumptions can i make based on that and you know how does that affect the equity of my of my play here and that and especially when you're thinking about whether to take a flip or not um, because that's when you it's not that you can't ever be wrong but you don't want to have made a dumb decision you know like you can be wrong but be wrong in the be wrong in this hand because you made a good decision and don't be afraid of that um, so so weigh it all in and I think got, you guys have brought up some really good points tonight any other tips for Monkey System or Binkley or Doug or Jim in 96 or any of the other uh, folks posting in here today? All right, well then I'd like to thank our normal, awesome, amazing sponsors, Learn Pro Poker, Website Amp and Running Aces, Hotel, Racetrack and Casino. I wanna thank Monkey System for writing in. And of course, Taylor Moss, John Somsky, Chris Jones and Rob Washam. We will see you next week.